All right, I'm going to talk very briefly about loss of strength um, due to earthquake loading. Um, this is really a topic for um, our earthquake engineering course, CE 225, where you would go through this in uh, quite a bit of detail, um, maybe over the span of many weeks. What I want to do is just talk about how some of the concepts that we teach in our earthquake engineering class are really applied in the context of slope stability. So I'm going to skip over a whole lot of details here, and if you're interested in the earthquake engineering aspects, you really should take our 225 class. So, um, okay, so first I'm going to talk about liquefaction of sand-like soil. Okay, when, when I talk about sand-like soil, I really mean a soil that is susceptible to liquefaction. Um, this could be a non-plastic silt or a sand with some fines in it, but the fines don't have a lot of plasticity, or obviously a clean sand, or even a gravel, potentially if there's um, impeded drainage and the gravel is not going to be free draining during earthquake shaking. So what we'll do first, assuming the soil is susceptible to liquefaction, is we'll do an assessment of whether liquefaction will trigger. And that's going to be a function of how dense is the soil and how strong is the shaking, and whether it plots above or below the liquefaction triggering curve. If a soil is identified as, um, as liquefying, the strength of shaking is high enough to cause the soil to liquefy, then we would move on to the second step, which is to assign an undrained residual shear strength to the liquefied soil, um, S sub R. And um, it, th this undrained word is very important because we will talk about residual shear strength for sedimentary rock, which is a big driver of landslides here in um, Southern California. And uh, the, the phrase residual strength really kind of should be reserved for that, but we do use it for liquefied soil, but it's important to say undrained residual strength. Um, and then you do a stability analysis. So you open up your slope stability software, you put in the appropriate undrained liquefied residual strength, and you run the stability analysis. So one thing that's important to note is that liquefied sand does not lose all of its strength. It retains some shear strength, uh, because as it is strained, the particles do come back into contact with each other and sometimes even cause a dilative response that will kind of lock the soil up and give it quite a bit of strength. So the undrained residual strength for dense sand can be actually fairly high, and generally it's pretty small for loose sand. So here's a, a schematic of kind of how um, this undrained strength works, these, each data point on this figure would be a separate case history where a um, stability failure occurred. Um, a lot of these are static stability fa failures um, in mine tailings and things like that. Some of them are earthquake induced, but what researchers have done is gone through and back calculated, given that this failure occurred, how much was the residual strength um, that was you know, associated with that failure. And they put those all on a plot. Usually it's N160 CS or some measure of penetration resistance on the x-axis. And then the y-axis is either um, just raw undrained residual strength, SR, or a lot of the time it's SR over sigma VC prime or sigma V naught prime, right? So it's like a normalized strength ratio. I won't get into those details here. I think there are good reasons both ways. But anyway, what you notice is that there's a huge amount of scatter, right? Lots of scatter in this plot. Some of the points are even down here close to zero if you look at the plot carefully. And at the same SPG blow count, other points are really pretty high. So um, something's going on there. There's not a very good fundamental relationship between undrained residual strength and the SPG blow count as measured maybe before an earthquake happens. And I'll talk about a reason why this might be the case uh, later on. Um, you know, we're, we're accustomed to dealing with a lot of scatter in geotechnical earthquake engineering and geotechnical engineering in general. This one really has a lot. This is a lot of uncertainty. So anyway, then you would take that undrained residual strength and put it here, maybe within this liquefied zone and, you know, all up here below the water table for this um, embankment that's impounding water. And you run your stability analysis and you figure out, is this thing going to move, right? And you know, if you find out that it is going to move, maybe there's going to be a flow failure happen, uh, that, you know, that would be something that you would have to potentially mitigate if the consequences are, are high and you would have to um, figure out how to prevent that soil from liquefying or mitigate the movements that may result from that 
um, liquefaction. All right, now um, we focus a lot of attention in earthquake engineering on liquefaction. And sometimes we lose track of the fact that cohesive soils can also lose shear strength and result in ground deformations or failures. So um, I'll talk real briefly about strength reduction in cohesive soil. This would be soil that we consider to be not susceptible to liquefaction, usually because it's just too clay rich. The plasticity index is high. Um, there's inner particle um, electromagnetic forces that bind the particles together to give it that plasticity. And as a result, it, it won't liquefy in the, in the traditional sense of sand-like liquefaction. So the way that I prefer to do this is to do cyclic testing. Anytime that you have a problem where cyclic strength reduction in clay may be an issue, I would recommend doing cyclic testing if you can talk your client into it and the budget permits. Uh, that's the preferred method. We, we don't really have enough data on this issue yet to have a real firm, thorough understanding of it. So on a project-specific basis, if you can do the cyclic testing, that's great. Next, you should assess whether your soil might be sensitive. And what I mean by sensitive would be like a quick clay. And we get these, you know, in parts of Scandinavia, in Quebec, there are regions where um, clays are deposited as marine clays in, in, you know, in the ocean, and they've subsequently been lifted up out of the water. And the salt that was in there at the time of deposition leaches out. And, you know, salts interact with clay minerals since they're electromagnetic um, and it will, it will suppress the double layer and the clay minerals kind of click together and they form this, um, this structure that's all flocculated. So it's like the, you know, there's a lot of open space in the clay, often the void ratio is very high and the clay is stable as long as the salt is in there to kind of um, stabilize the electrochemical interactions. When that salt leaches out, the clay stays like that in this kind of honeycomb structure with the you know, the negatively charged end of the clay mineral kind of attached to the positively charged surface, or I guess it's the other way around. But as soon as that salt is gone, that stabilizing force isn't there, and if something disturbs the clay, the clay minerals repel each other again, and they will uh, behave like a liquid. It really does look like soil liquefaction. We don't have much sensitive clay here in Southern California because we don't have a lot of soft marine clays. So uh, if it's not sensitive, then um, you can use some of these methods in the literature to reduce the strength by some modest amount. We're not talking about a reduction in strength that would be like for a liquefiable sand, where we go from what is a pretty high drain strength to something that's very low undrained strength. Usually we're already starting with an undrained strength that's often not very high. And then we reduce it by maybe just a factor of 0.8 or something like that. This is from Boulanger and Idris in 2007. They suggest that for a magnitude 7.5 earthquake, a reduction of about 0.8 seems to be appropriate um, for a clay-like soil. And, and the way they determined that was based on a bunch of laboratory tests where tau cyclic over undrained strength is plotted versus number of loading cycles. So tau cyclic over SU would be the, the in a direct simple shear test, how much cyclic shear stress is imposed compared to the monotonic undrained shear strength. And then you would get a curve that looks like this, where that curve would correspond to some failure condition, often 3% strain or something like that. And so uh, for a given amount of cyclic stress, you're going to reach that failure condition in some number of cycles. And as you reduce the cyclic stress amplitude, that number of cycles increases. And so, you know, this is kind of what the monotonic behavior might look like for a, a clay-like soil. And if you were to cyclically load it at some fraction of its strength, the strain would gradually accumulate with each cycle and then eventually reach this condition that matches your failure criterion. Maybe that's 3% strain or something. I should label my axes here. This is tau and gamma. And so maybe we would end the test here, you know, right at this point because we've now exceeded our, our strain threshold to define failure. So note that this is not actually the, the peak. Like if you were to stop the test here and then do a monotonic loading after that, you know, where would it go? Is it going to go just follow this and go flat? Or is it going to go back up and reach the monotonic strength? Well, there's some evidence that it does permanently reduce that strength too, just from remolding. But this criterion is for 3%. So it's, you know, just keep that in mind when you incorporate it into a stability analysis. 
All right, now why is there so much scatter in this relationship for liquefied sand between undrained residual strength and the um, SPT blow count for that layer? It seems like there should be a good relationship there because a denser sand is going to have a much higher undrained strength than a looser sand, but that relationship is not all that strong. There's definitely a trend, it's there, but it's not as strong as, as it should be based on our understanding of soil mechanics and laboratory testing and so forth. So another thing that I'll add to this is that many failures of slopes have been observed to occur after strong shaking ends, sometimes many minutes later. So it's not like right at the end of shaking, maybe it liquefied and then moved to gravity. No, this is like sometimes 40 minutes have passed and then the slope moved. And so there's something going on there. There's some uh, movement of water happening and some sedimentation and all these system effects going on that's causing this delayed failure to happen. And void redistribution is one mechanism that can happen and it can result in a significant loosening of sand right below a low permeability interface. And that loosening can result in a delayed failure because it takes time for it to happen. So um, here's, a, here's just the schematic, right? Here's a ground surface, low permeability layer on top of some sand. And if this, the slope angle is really steep, but anyway, if it does get shaken by an earthquake and the sand liquefies, it's gonna induce a hydraulic gradient, right? Maybe the gradient's upward, maybe it's kind of normal to the slope. It would depend on the geometry of the problem. But the water's trying to get out by going upward through this low permeability layer. But the low permeability layer is not allowing that seepage to move upward, right? So the water is kind of trying to move up and it's accumulating at the interface between the sand and the low permeability layer here. Meanwhile, the sand is locally draining, right? This problem may be globally undrained and that the water can't get out, but sand particles can move around within the sand layer. So you'll get a densification near the bottom and then a dilation near the top. And that dilation will cause the sand to become weaker gradually as the sand particles loosen. And maybe after some amount of time, you will get this uh, slope failure when the sand becomes weak enough that you know the shear strength is no longer high enough to accommodate the static driving shear stress from the low permeability crust. If you have level ground, you know, let's say that there's no slope here at all, well, then that crust layer is not going to slide anywhere. It's just going to sit there it's actually been observed that you can observe, you can develop a film of water between the low permeability crust and the sand. And slowly over time, that water will seep through the low permeability layer and the low permeability layer will settle and come back in contact with the sand. It's definitely a transient seepage problem. It's not um, sort of steady state, um, statically stable. So over time, things will change. Or you'll get a fissure through the silt or the crust and you know, a sand boil will come up and flow out over the ground, sur ground surface and sand particles will come out along with the water. So anyway, the impeded drainage causes loosening of sand right below the interface, densening of sand deeper in the profile to maintain kind of a global undrained condition. You could even get a water film in level ground. You won't get a water film in sloping ground because before that water film forms, you will get a shear strength at the interface that's lower than the static driving shear stress, and so the slope will fail before you get to the water film condition. As a result of that, that pre-earthquake N160CS that you got during your site investigation, right? maybe the sand had a relative density of 50% when you went out and did the SPT blow counts. Well, that, that may not be the density that ends up happening up here right below that interface. So you could get a medium dense sand that becomes very loose and then fails. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why you see so much scatter, because we, we can't figure out all the time like how much void ratio change is there going to be and what strength is really the appropriate one. The only thing we have is the pre-earthquake SPT blow counts. And so um, in general, this is a mechanism that should happen more in loose sands. There's more um, tendency for the loose sands to contract, so you get more contraction here, and as a result, more dilation there to maintain that overall volume. And um, let's see, Idris and Boulanger did recommend a relationship shown here um, that has a line for the undrained residual strength with void redistribution right there, and then one with no void redistribution here. And so you can use a higher strength if you think void redistribution is not going to happen. 
but you have to use a lower strength if you think void redistribution might happen. And so cases where void redistribution might happen are just ones where you have these permeability contrasts. You're going to need to have some kind of low permeability capping layer on top of the liquefied sand in order to cause void redistribution to happen. Otherwise, the water will just get out and the sand will settle and densify as a result.